50 kilometers. That's all that separates South Korea's bustling port of Busan from Japan's Tsushima Island, a gap smaller than the English Channel spanned in 1994. Yet these two engineering giants, known for bullet trains and soaring bridges, still rely on slow ferries and congested flights. Every year, 50 million travelers and 80 million tons of cargo roar through the Korea Strait by air or sea, proving enormous demand. Designers have sketched tunnels longer than the Channel Tunnel and bridges twice Akashikaikyo, while financiers whisper of $70 billion budget seeking somewhere to land. So why does the strait remain unbridged? Today, we delve into the real reason the Japan-Korea bridge remains a dream and why building it might be more complex than anyone dares to admit. Stand on Busan's Hyundai Beach at dawn and on a crystal clear winter day, you can actually glimpse Japan's Tsushima Island flashing like a silver blade on the horizon. The straight line distance there is barely 50 kilometers, short enough that hikers have captured the silhouette on smartphone cameras. But geography is no friend to bridge builders. The Korea Strait is split into two channels by Tsushima Island. The western throat plunges to roughly 230 meters, while the eastern Tsushima Strait averages a still daunting 140 meters. That means a pier would need foundations three Eiffel Towers tall just to kiss bedrock. And Kais and Koffer dams would battle hydrostatic pressures that can crush a still diver's bell in seconds. Add in width, from Koratsu on Kyushu to Busan, the water corridor stretches about 209 kilometers at the favored engineering alignment, with 145 kilometers of that submerged, nearly three times longer than the Channel Tunnel under the English Channel. Those numbers alone balloon concrete volumes and ventilation costs, but dynamic water makes them worse. The Tsushima warm current funnels through the strait at velocities topping one meter per second, with embedded tidal pulses reaching 50 centimeters per second. Engineers designing foundations would face lateral forces equivalent to 30 fully loaded Boeing 747s nudging each bridge tower every minute. Then there's traffic. More than 75,000 commercial voyages a year and over 200 ships a day already threat this same corridor, many hauling liquefied natural gas to Japanese ports or Hyundai vehicles to world markets. Any fixed link must clear supertankers with drafts of 20 meters and accommodate traffic separation schemes monitored by Japanese and Korean coast guards. Even with a bridge span rivaling the Chanakale Marvel, engineers would still face a combined 128 kilometers of tunnel, far surpassing any submarine tunnel ever built. Maritime audits from Tokyo's transport ministry logged 75,000 ship transits a year, a quarter on hulls older than 20 years. Blocking even one lane to drop foundation caissons could choke a tenth of South Korean freight, spiking transport costs overnight. That alone scares port authorities senseless. If foundations are the bones of a bridge, the land they anchor into is the beating heart, and in the Korea Strait, that heart skips dangerous beats. The southern peninsula is laced with Yangsan and Ulsan faults, both capable of magnitude 6 quakes. The 2016 Gyeongju earthquake at 5.8 cracked historic temples and left schools shut for weeks. Japan's side sits atop the triple junction of the Yama, Okhotsk, and Philippine Sea Plates. One reason Kyushu's Sakurajima volcano erupts over a thousand times a year and why the 2016 Kumamoto twin quakes killed 272 people. Drive piles here and your engineering inside nature's boxing ring, seismologists mapping the strait found focal depths as shallow as 10 kilometers, meaning surface acceleration can spike unexpectedly. Eurocode bridge guidelines typically designed for ground accelerations up to 0.35 g. Sensors near Busan recorded 0.5 g spikes during Typhoon Miami, when waves and wind synchronized with ground motion. Yes, typhoons. An average of three tropical cyclones a year skirt or hit Korea. In 2020, three storms, Bavi, Maisak, and Haishen struck in just two weeks, a historic first. Meteorologists traced to a warming western Pacific. Busan's port anemometer clocked gusts at 96 miles per hour in Miami, ripping 40-meter container cranes from their tracks and sinking a Russian tanker at anchor. Imagine a half-built suspension tower swaying under that load, still unsecured to its final cables. Engineers can design wind shedders and tuned mass dampers, but they can't pause a typhoon season that stretches June through October, nor silence the freak winter bomb cyclones that occasionally barrel out of Siberia. 
Wave modeling shows storm surges reaching 3 meters in shallow bays, enough to overtop cofferdams and flood tunnel portals. Meanwhile, Busan's reclaimed coastal zones are sinking up to 5 millimeters per year because of groundwater extraction. Combine that with saltwater corrosion rates doubled by Tsushima warm current temperatures, and you start counting maintenance costs in decades, not centuries. And remember, every extra centimeter of concrete poured to survive that punishment adds tons to a project already flirting with record-breaking scale. When engineers drew the first Japan-Korea tunnel lines in the mid-1980s, the bill came to 70 billion US dollars already 10 times the cost of the freshly completed channel tunnel. Inflation, stricter safety codes, and longer alignments now push estimates past $150 billion, or 15 trillion yen, according to studies released in 2024. That's more than NASA's Artemis Moon program or South Korea's entire annual defense budget. Why so high? Length matters. The favored Busan Karatsu route demands 209 kilometers of combined bridge and tunnel, with a record smashing 145 kilometers under seabed rock. For perspective, the Seikan Tunnel, Earth's longest undersea railway at 53 kilometers, cost roughly around 4 billion US dollars in 1988 currency and still struggles with maintenance bills today. Scale that threefold and factor in deeper water, hotter currents, and higher seismic loads and accountants start sweating. The materials alone boggle the mind, enough concrete to fill 4,800 Olympic pools, steel weighing more than 30 aircraft carriers and rubber gaskets measured in megatons. Concrete must cure in pressurized caissons, steel must be duplex alloy to resist chloride pitting accelerated by 28 degrees summer seas, powering construction demands a temporary grid rivaling a mid-sized city. Ventilation shafts would require offshore artificial islands every 30 kilometers, each costing about $1 billion. We're talking custom monsters, tunnel boring machines with 14 meter cutter heads, pressure balanced to 14 bar, drawing 90 megawatts apiece, three times the load of Saul's Lot World Tower. And the cost doesn't stop at completion. Eurotunnel spends about $190 million a year on maintenance. Apply the same per kilometer ratio, and a Japan-Korea tunnel would need nearly 1 billion annually. Toll modeling by the Korea Transport Institute suggests fares could exceed 200 US dollars one way just to cover interest, a price rivaling flights and double current ferry costs. Financial analysts at Nomura calculated that even with optimistic demand, the project's internal rate of return barely hits 3%, assuming zero overruns and volatile commodity markets over the decade. So if money alone can hobble this mega project, imagine the headache when you dive into the wartime debris still lurking on the seabed. A shadow carrying explosive meaning in every sense. Even if the engineering hurdles vanished overnight, the strait remains haunted by both literal mines and metaphorical ghosts of war. The waters between Busan and Kyushu served as a Second World War dumping ground for thousands of naval mines and unexploded ordnance. As recently as December 2023, Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force detonated a rusted mine in the nearby Kanmon Straits, blasting a 40-story column of water skyward. Japanese Defense Ministry estimates suggest thousands of devices may still lie scattered across the Tsushima seabed. Mine clearance averages $40,000 per device, clearing even a conservative 5-kilometer-wide corridor could consume another billion. Strategists in both Tokyo and Seoul worry about the living threats from Pyongyang. North Korea has dug at least four infiltration tunnels under the demilitarized zone and regularly sends wooden ghost boats to Japan's coastlines. Military white papers warn that a direct fixed link could, in theory, become an invasion superhighway. Or worse, an escape route for covert agents with radiological or cyber payloads. Tokyo's parliament quietly iced tunnel funding bills in 2022 after media exposed ties between the project's main lobby group and the controversial Unification Church. In Seoul, opposition lawmakers branded the project a security suicide pact during fiery hearings in 2024. Even the name sparks debate. Japanese planners say Japan-Korea Tunnel. Korean planners revert it. Diplomatic wording aside, both sides have shown intermittent interest in reviving talks, hinting that shared interest may one day outweigh historic grievances. Until those ghosts of war and pride are exercised, no contractor will lower a single drill bit. 
Yet, politics is fluid, and the Straits history shows alliances can shift as fast as currents. Few stretches of ocean carry as much historic baggage as the Korea Strait. Between 1910 and 1945, more than a million Koreans crossed it, in forced labor drafts to support Japan's empire. Every April, tensions flare as Japan's Blue Book reasserts its claim to the islets Koreans called Dokto and Japanese called Takashima. Seoul summoned Tokyo's envoy again on the 16th of April 2024. How do you build a joint mega bridge when you cannot agree who owns a pair of rocks? A 2023 Hankook Ilbo poll found 68% of South Koreans opposed any tunnel without a new apology, while a Nikkei survey showed 54% of Japanese feared dependence on Korea. Economists, however, still see mutual opportunity. Japan exported $46.38 billion worth of goods to South Korea in 2024, while Korea shipped $29 billion the other way. A fixed link could slash container costs by nearly 30%, according to the Japan Korea Tunnel Research Institute, and create up to 450,000 jobs during construction. Whether that diplomatic dance ever reaches full span remains uncertain. And while old wounds run deep, the sheer scale of mutual benefit, from trade to technology collaboration, offers a rare chance to turn a contentious strait into a shared success. What do you think? Should Japan and Korea finally build the bridge, or are the risks just too high for now? Drop your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more deep dives like this.